this morning, I want to talk to you about Alan. Alan had epilepsy. Actually, he had an assortment of neurological issues. Epilepsy was just one of them. You wouldn't know it by looking at him. At about six foot five and with a strong build, rugged face and chiseled features, Alan appeared to be the picture of health. If you saw him on the street or in the park, you would assume this man, certainly this man, needs no one to take care of him. If you learned he was homeless, you would assume it must be of his own doing, perhaps drugs, perhaps alcohol, or some other bad decision of his own choosing. After all, we would think, he has the strength, he has the power, he has the ability to take care of himself if he really wanted to. We would think as such because most of us live within the neatly ruled lines of the page. We too easily think that those who dwell in the margins just need to step inside the lines and act a little more like the rest of us. If only they would just pick themselves up by the bootstraps and work hard like we do. After all, we are living rightly. They are living wrongly. And we would think the best way to help them would be to show them how to live like us inside the lines. I met Alan one night when the police brought him to the St. John's homeless shelter. He had suffered a seizure on a nearby sidewalk. He became disoriented, collapsed, and convulsed in the cold snow. Some well-meaning soul saw him, perhaps a neighborhood resident, perhaps a passerby. But someone saw him and called the police to report a drunk who had passed out. How often are we so confident in the judgments we make about other people? How often are we confident when, in fact, we only see what we expect to see and not what really is. How often are we more interested in our own perceptions than in reality, in our own opinions, than in truth? In the process of his seizure, Alan lost control of his own system and soiled himself quite severely. So when he arrived in a squad car at the shelter, he was quite embarrassed and humiliated. He was broken, ashamed, frightened, defeated, and confused. When I looked into his face, I saw an image of humanity I had never before seen so purely and so authentically. I saw the vulnerable but divinely sacred image of a man who had been stripped of all pretense and basic dignity. Alan didn't need to be helped back inside the lines. He needed someone to reach out into the margins and touch him. He didn't need to be fixed. He needed to be loved. At that time, there was only one shower in the shelter and the hot water lasted about 10 minutes. Guests would line up for 15-minute slots, and they would wait for four hours or more for a cold shower. It would get very political. I learned to really appreciate the freedom and gift I enjoyed to have access to a hot shower on my own schedule. Very, very few people in our world live with such luxury. It's rather sad but true, isn't it, how so often we need those who live outside the lines to remind us to be grateful for all the simple things we just take for granted. I'm a little embarrassed about that. Each night, one of the shelter volunteers was assigned to keep track of the schedule, regulate access, and negotiate disputes as people traded shower spots for cigarettes and bus passes. The shower volunteer that particular night was my good friend Tony Pickler with whom I started Streetlights Outreach in 2004. So I took Tony aside for a moment and had a brief discussion about bringing Alan up to the front of the shower line. We needed to figure out how to communicate to those who had been on the list for several hours 
why we were letting Alan go in front of them without actually explaining why. And then when he was in the shower, I went into the storage area to find new clothes for this man who needed double, large, extra, big and tall, everything. Now, I'd been working with the homeless for more than a few years in the shelters and on the streets, and I had heard a lot of stories, enough stories of abuse, pain, and loss to soften even the hardest heart, or perhaps harden the softest. I wasn't always sure from t day to day which side of that equation I was on. I had noticed I wasn't moved by the stories anymore. Perhaps I, like others who lived on a neatly ruled page, had grown callous as the defense against the reality. Or perhaps it had all become too normal for me. I just knew I didn't feel things as deeply as I once had. But there's a difference. There's a difference between hearing someone tell you about their pain and living in the moment with their pain. It's easy to be sympathetic in theory, but so much harder to be empathetic in practice. From the comfort of our own living rooms, we pray for those on the margins, the sick, the hungry, the homeless, the lonely, and so forth, and we pray with all sincerity. But we keep ourselves separate. We talk about the unity and the oneness of all humanity, but it's more of an intellectual exercise than a spiritual one because we protect ourselves from really experiencing it. On that night in that place, Alan shook me awake. I felt myself wanting to take on some of his pain simply so he wouldn't have to feel so alone with the burden. So there I was, digging through the storage room, desperately looking for pants, shirts, socks, underwear, a warm sweatshirt, shorts and a t-shirt to sleep in, a complete wardrobe in a hard-to-fit size. And the reality of Alan's life hit me like a foot to the gut. I wasn't looking for clothes. I was searching with him for his restored dignity. For the first time in all the years I had been working with the homeless, I was moved to tears. I sat down on a box in that room and cried. And it happened because I had been pulled beyond the secure lines of my own page by looking directly into the eyes of a brother living in the margin. As I began finding the pieces, something else happened. As I located the various items, the gently used, some like the socks and underwear purchased new and donated, I became overwhelmed with gratitude for the thoughtful and generous people who donated these items and for the wonderful volunteers who had collected and sorted them. None of these people would ever know me, they would never know Alan or his story, but they had given with caring and faith-filled hearts. I felt connected with them. It was a mystical experience, a truly holy communion, and I was profoundly grateful. All these people were joined with me in lifting up Alan. See, the problem we have in living neatly and securely within the lines is that the lines have a way of dividing us. We can experience a certain level of oneness with our spouses, our children, parents, maybe a few close friends and family, but it tends to stop there. Our own comfort zones and fragile egos keep our world small and inhibit us from glimpsing into the nirvana, the utopia, the heaven that is possible for those who dare to let their love reach into the messiness of the margins, beyond the lines of their neatly tailored page.
This is the lesson Siddhartha discovers in the famous novel of the same name. The journey each person walks can't be fulfilled when we keep the lines drawn to support our own comfort. This is what the Buddha teaches us. It's what Jesus teaches us when he touches the leper. The way is not found when we try to fix people and make them more like us, but rather when we love them for who they are, right where they are. My friends, this is the gift of the margins. It shakes us from the smallness of our own comfort and challenges us to live a life in which the love we share has no boundaries. And this is the prayer I share with you, that each of us finds the strength and the courage to let go of all those notions and contrivances that narrow our lives and keeps our love small.